you are welcome again to this series of lectures. Uh, and to this lecture, uh, to this lecture will be anchored by Dr. Infia Ichuku Ona. Dr. Infia Ichuku Ona is a consultant plastic surgeon. He is the current head of plastic surgery department at the your National Orthopedic Hospital in Enugu, Nigeria. Uh, he's also the spine training program coordinator at that same hospital. And in 2014, he was the Smart Train Global Award winner. And um, he has many published articles, up to 40 published articles in scholarly journals. Dr. Ifia Ihona will be taking on today's lecture on combined cleft lip and palate procedures. Uh, just before he takes over from me, I will admonish you to put your questions on the chat box when you have questions for him, and also to make sure that you keep your microphones muted, that is if you have access to your microphones. So I will now hand over to Dr. Infia Iona for his lecture. Thank you. Hey, good day, everyone. Um, so today we are going on with the combined cleft lip and palate uh, surgery. And I'll be doing it with this outline a bit of introduction, the rationale for it. We'll look at the literature review. Um, we'll then talk a bit of experience we've had and uh, conclude. A lot of things I expect will come up during the question and answer session. Well, by introduction, cleft lip and palate anomalies, they are among the commonest anomalies of the craniofacial region and Patients with cleft lip and cleft palate, they need series of procedures so as to attain near normal appearance and near normal function. Of the two, the palate repair is the more functional one. The lip affects aesthetics so much uh, and the palate affects function, speech, swallowing, uh, speech and uh, yeah, taking in food uh, a lot more. Now, thanks to Smile Train and a host of other NGOs, these treatments are free now, but despite it, completion of palatoplasties for patients who have both lip and palate still remains a challenge. Actually, studies that come from Meduguri uh, showed that at a time, up to 90% of those who have lip and palate will only do the lip and not do the palate. Studies from Benin showed more than 60% would do the lip and not come for the palate. And we uh, had our own series of about 40 something percent in Enugu, which we published. And the reasons that were adduced for this would include ignorance, poor motivation, cultural beliefs, limited access to specialized health services. This challenge is not only in Nigeria, from other parts of Africa and other parts of the world, we have this challenge of people who have lip and palate not completing the procedures uh, as they should. Now, commonly we expect that the timing for the lip would be as from 10 weeks, three months by smart train requirements, and then palate repair uh, from nine months to 18 months or whenever they present and are fit. These are the times that we expect to do uh, these things. And we know that there are different protocols in existence for the repair of cleft lip and cleft palate. And the most common one is a stage protocol. You do the lip at this time and you do the palate at this time. 
like we've said before, despite the advent of free treatment, a significant backlog of cases exists. The parents of these patients appear to be more interested in the aesthetics than in the functional aspects. When we looked at our series between January 2012 and December 2016, we accessed the results by July 2017. We noted that there were 26 patients with cleft lip and palate deformity that presented for surgery, and seven only had completed to palate repair by July 2017, which means just 24.17%. Now that showed a drop. We had noted 40 something percent before, before the free treatment started. Now with the free treatment, we noted a, 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 an even greater drop. So we have ability to call them on the phone. Sometimes you find that they've entered in the wrong number or due to clerical error, you have a wrong number. Tracking and follow-up is incomplete. As a result, we're not able to see all the patients with cleft lip and palate do their lip and the palate repair in a timely fashion. Now, whichever series you look at, patients with cleft lip and palate are significant. In the series that we have, uh, they are the second most common following isolated cleft lip. But Fogandesen found that they were the most common is in, in his own series. So if you have patients with cleft lip and palate, you are dealing with a very significant uh, population of patients with cleft. And if they're not able to complete their procedures, then there's something that still remains of the work that we have to do. So if we want to look at the combined procedure, the combined procedure will actually result in a completion of the lip and the palate procedure at the same time. It will ensure that that more functional repair of palatoplasty is done. And uh, from some studies, there are suggestions that single stage repair of congenital anomalies where possible have better outcomes than when the surgeries are staged, where they are uh, uh, able to do them. But there are questions which arise when we say, let's do combined cleft lip and palate. The first question which we must always ask is, how safe is it? Then we're going to narrow the airway somewhat. So what are we going to do about the post-operative respiratory challenge? What about intraoperative blood loss? Then when the procedure is done, we need to ask ourselves, is there a difference in the fistula rates? Are we going to do a procedure that actually at the end of the day is going to hurt the patient some more? What about speech outcomes? What about mid-phase growth disturbances? These are questions that as clinicians and as researchers, we need to answer so as to evaluate the usefulness or otherwise of the procedure. So what form does the combined cleft lip and palate procedure take? It is actually a spectrum of surgeries and it ranges from when you have incomplete cleft lip an incomplete cleft palate, which is both type one or both type two. Like you see this patient with uh, 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 TCR zero, you can see it's incomplete. The nostril is not, not uh, divided and there is a cleft in the palate. The two pictures show the same patient. And you can see from this picture that uh, this margag is right there where the lip uh, defect is. So you can have that and you may expect that there will not be too much time taken, but you can also have this, a vote type four, where there's a complete bilateral cleft lip and uh, cleft of the palate as well, bilateral. So this will be probably the most challenging to 
undertake a combined procedure. But we have also included patients like this who have cleft lip and palate who need a lip revision whilst the palate hasn't been repaired. So the combined procedure could be where there is incomplete lip, go type one or two palate, or go type four, or lip revision with a, a palatoplasty that needs to be done. So let's look a bit at the literature. Uh, Hodges, Andrew Hodges is credited with the largest series of combined cleft lip and palate by a single surgeon in Africa. And in 2009, he produced, he produced uh, his uh, work on 106 patients that had simultaneous combined cleft lip and palate repair under the age of 10 months. This was the largest series in Africa. All the patients underwent cleft palate repair followed by cleft lip repair at a single sitting. And he was the surgeon that operated on all 106 of them. He used the similar technique and bilateral Langebeck type relaxing incisions were indicated for the palate repair. Of them all, 67% had unilateral lip uh, and uh, he used a modified Millard repair and 32% had a bilateral lip defect and he used uh, a Mulliken repair and one had a midline cleft. Now, the mean duration of his work uh, when he had the surgery was 97 minutes. So he didn't spend up to two hours in any of the surgeries that he did. And uh, yeah, there was neither mortality nor significant anesthetic complications. Two patients had low oxygen saturation postoperatively and were returned to the theater. In both cases, he removed the soft palate sutures and the airway improved to a safe degree, permitting return for subsequent uh, final repair. All the patients were discharged home without any ongoing problems. Later on, postoperatively, one had a unilateral dehiscence. That was in someone that had a bilateral lip and seven patients underwent a secondary procedure to close a palatal fistula. So early follow-up results are encouraging. Only 8% 8 per, 8 of patients required a secondary procedure or a second procedure. So the conclusion in his paper was that combined lip and palate repair is technically challenging, but is a safe procedure which enables the complete cleft condition to be repaired early in a single operation. Well, Qatar in 2015 did a literature review of 22 relevant articles. All of them were retrospective in nature. Uh, we don't have many prospective reports concerning this. And the age range was from one month to 10 years with the longest duration of follow-up 18 years the largest study included 106 patients. That's the study by Hodges. The review shows that overall surgical outcomes followed combined, following combined cleft lip and palate repair are encouraging. There is an increase in rate of postoperative fistulas associated with a few speech anomalies in some of those studies. Now remember that this pool of studies includes a vast variety of surgeons and not a single surgeon. Importantly, there is no evidence to suggest an impact on cranial maxillofacial growth and psychosocial outcomes. There is parental satisfaction that is improved with single stage surgery as compared with the stage approach. What were the conclusions of this literature review? Overall favorable outcomes, 
but the limited follow-up time or nature of evaluated outcome in some subjects or in some studies may underrepresent the true rates of adverse effects and highlight the need for additional long-term studies with standardized follow-up. Like we pointed out, these have all been retrospective in nature. We need some prospective ones. Well, he in 2019, uh, same Qatar, uh, published a pool of uh, America's largest cohort uh, at the time of his publication involving 181 patients with the combined cleft lip and palate surgery group uh, as compared with 1,007 with the uh, lip repair and uh, 783 with the palate repair. Now, what is important is that there was no difference in the rates of early complication found in three groups. And the analysis of a national database showed that the single stage repair is not associated with an increased risk of early postoperative complications as compared to primary lip or palate repair alone. He recommended in-depth long-term analysis of craniofacial morphology, fistula rate, speech, and dental outcomes for a comprehensive assessment of the effects of combined cleft lip and palate repair. Now, we recognize that these are surgeries that can take a long time. Longer times are actually required for these operations, but the time you take for cleft lip and palate in one sitting is shorter than the time you would take if you did the lip and then you come back and do the palate. In my own experience, the time has ranged from an hour 45 minutes for the two to three hours 30 minutes. And three hours 30 minutes was when I did it the first time. Uh, I hadn't that much experience at then. So what is the protocol? Remember, with smart train, it is not recommended that you do the cleft lip and palate in one procedure earlier than one year of age. So the patient must have attained one year of age before you consider doing that on the smart train. I emphasize that the patient must be appropriately weighted for age. Smart train also does that too. Now, we must be quite careful because the risk of airway uh, challenge is significantly more here so there must be no hint of respiratory tract infection. Uh, I once had this done with a patient who had Down syndrome. Now they have a large tongue and I had challenges postoperatively. The patient made it through, but I don't expect that people who are syndromic with uh, large tongue and other uh, challenges should have the combined stage it. That is better. The investigations that you do are going to be the same investigations as those with cleft lip and cleft palate. Recently, for some years now, we've been using tranexamic acid of 15 milligrams per kg, 30 minutes before onset of, uh, the, uh, of, of the incision to help reduce the risk of blood transmission. Now, I must emphasize, even before we started using tranexamic acid for our patients for palate repair, we have not needed to do blood transfusion for any that we did combined lip and palate with. I've never had need for that. But uh, we believe that the use of tranexamic acid improves the safety profile and reduces the risk of transfusion. So in terms of the technique, as with um, Hodges, I, I learned from him and uh, I also watched uh, him do some procedures. Uh, the palate repair comes first. If you look at this patient, which uh, you can see that the lip has not been repaired. This is a patient with uh, bow type four. The palate repair uh, is done here uh, before the lip. There's palate repair done first 
and we always use infiltration of lidocaine and adrenaline. Now, after the pallet is repaired, you remove the pack from the pharynx, remove the uh, Paul Davis or Dingman mount gag. This one is Dingman mount gag. And then you still put a pack here, which will help tamponade whilst you do the lip repair. It helps make sure that the pallet is dry uh, post-operatively. Now, when you have done that, you then get to the lip, you infiltrate and repair the lip. So this is a patient that I had shown you before uh, that had uh, hair lip. After the pallet was repaired, you can see that the lip isn't repaired here, but the pallet has been repaired. The pack is taken out and here the lip is repaired and the uh, patient did quite fine. So this is that patient. Uh, she's a three-year-old with go type four. This is her pre-op. This is her post-operatively. Uh, 14 weeks after surgery. I've seen her now for up to one year. She's doing fine. The mother is happy. There was a breakdown, but it closed up on its own uh, and the pallet for her. Now, for the one that had previous uh, lip repair but required revision, uh, we also did that. I include such, since you have to do a redo of the lip and then the pallet, I include such as combined. Um, this is him post-operatively. So what has been our experience with such procedures? At the National Orthopedic Hospital, when we look at primary lip and primary palate being done in combination, not with revision, primary lip and primary palate repair, uh, we've done eight such in the National Orthopedic Hospital out of the 601 surgeries uploaded in the Smile Train uh, Express. And at the Good Shepherd Specialist Hospital, we've also had six primary out of 229 surgeries. So that makes it about 1.69% of procedures. Of them, eight were unilateral lip and palate, five were bilateral lip and palate, and one is the midline that I had shown you. Now, when we combine those that have to have revision or uh, do a redo of the lip of the palate, it boosts the number to 34, which brings it up to just about 4.1% of procedures done in the period. There has been no need for blood transfusion in any of the times that we have done it, and the average post-operative stay was three days. That's been our experience. So let me just present as we close uh, the data that was uh, gathered for us by Dr. Ilo Canulo uh, for an audit we did between 2010 and 2014 of the combined cases that we did. We noted at that time between 2010 and 2014, 20 combined procedures. We couldn't find four case notes. And um, the clinical outcomes that were assessed during the follow-up visits included the morbidity, the mortality and the complications and any improvement. At, and from that study, at that time, there were eight males, eight females, uh, and um, the age range was between two months and 36 years. That was before we had the moratorium on the age. Uh, overall mean age at the time of repair was 9.8 years. Um, 43 0.75% presented at infancy, 12.5% presented in childhood, and 43.75% presented in adulthood. And uh, this is what the age distribution was like. Expectedly, unilateral cleft lip and palate surgeries were more than bilateral uh, cleft lip and palate surgeries. And nine of those surgeries were primary procedures, and seven were secondary procedures. The patients were discharged usually uh, after a short time, 
14 of them were discharged within 24 hours. Two were discharged after five days and nine days, uh, respectively. Of the 16 surgeries, nine were judged to have a good outcome, while seven had some bit of complications. Now, we'll talk about the complications that we had at that time. Four of the complications followed primary procedures and three followed secondary procedures. That is to say, four of them were those that were in patients with primary lip and primary palate, and three of them were those that had a revision of the lip or the palate. The complications that we speak about had to do with the Gisens, uh, hypertrophy, or nasal fistula, and these were the distribution. Uh, the essence of the lip or the palate was the most common, especially, especially uh, the essence of the palate. Like we pointed out, some of them went on to close. The quantity of blood was not recorded in the case notes. Uh, that is one of the limitations of what we are doing, but none of those that we did required blood transfusion. There was no case of peri or postoperative mortality in any of them in that series or now. Now, with regard to speech, no matter the age at the surgery, because some of them were people that were adults that had already formed speech up to 20 years of age, uh, all manifested some improvements in speech. We've also uh, presented a series of adults that had uh, palate repair and their speech outcomes. The evaluation was done by speech therapists. We haven't been able to do cephalometrics to determine um, facial growth. We haven't seen problems with that. So the techniques that we used, Moller's modification of Milad for unilateral lip, uh, then bilateral, uh, Milad for clap or Mulikins well used. Then for the palate, we did von Langenberg type incisions, relaxing incisions with intravillar veloplasty, or we would need to do Bardak type when we had to do Go type four. And in some cases, we did uh, a summer lad. Where we had a fistula, we used local flaps to close the fistula. I was the surgeon in the cases, and for this series we had in National Pedic Hospital, we always had a physician anesthetist to handle the anesthesia. So, as I round up, I say to us, and I know we agree, we really must find solutions for these patients. This is a woman that has come with cleft lip and cleft palate unrepaired in adulthood, and all safe options are attractive. From literature in Africa, from literature outside of Africa, the combined procedure is not common, but it is safe. Thank you very much. I'm done. Time for questions and comments. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Anna, for this great lecture and uh, for the clarity of the presentation. We now welcome questions and comments. Please, I will admonish us to put our questions and comments in the Q&A box. So we can, so the presenter can answer our questions. Please put your questions in the question and answer the Q and A box. Thank you. Right now there are no questions uh, in the Q and A box, so I will just, for the moment, request the presenter to tell us if there are challenges that you have met with in this procedure of combined 
cleft lip and palate surgery and uh, how you have been able to overcome those challenges. Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the challenges I have. Why is answering the question, please? Yes. Please go ahead, sir. The, the challenges I've had has been to do with patient selection. If you take note, uh, these cases are few. The reason is that you must select your patient very well so that you don't run into the kind of patient that will give you more problems post-operatively. It's not doing the operation that is the issue. It's sailing through the post-operative period. So you have to choose the patient right. Make sure that the patient is appropriately weighted for age and does not have any challenges that you are trying to manage. Make sure that you have the right type of uh, instrumentation to get all these things done. Now, this is a teaching session, so it's good to share uh, errors that you have had and what to do. I heard, I once did one on a patient with down syndrome, post-operatively oxygen saturation dropped. We had to give oxygen for a very long time. That's the patient that you saw there that had to spend a lot of time in the hospital. I should not have done that for that patient at that time. So of course, since that I have not uh, repeated that mistake. So post-operative uh, respiratory challenge if you have a premorbid condition that could cause it. That is what uh, I have experienced one time. And that, as far as I'm concerned, was because of poor patient selection. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you for that. Uh, another, another concern, while we wait for people to post their questions in the Q&A box, is uh, seeing that you do the palate first. And that means you are in contact with, the, with intraoral organisms, since you cannot sterilize the, the mouth, as it were. Have you had any issues with post-operative infections in any of these patients that you did? I use povidonardine, usually the ointment, to take care of that challenge. I use it on the oropharynx, the palatal shelves, and uh, the buccal cavity. And uh, at the initial time, I would run it all the way through the nasal cavities as well. So um, I do cleansing of the mucosa very well with uh, betadine. Um, Povidonardine ointment, 5% uh, or 10%, depending on the one that is available. And I have always practiced prophylactic antibiotic usage for patients that I'm uh, doing clefts on. Uh, no, I don't have that problem. Uh, that is how I have sought to avoid it. Thank you for your response. I think uh, from what I can see, we don't have further questions in the Q&A box. So I will hand over back to Victoria for the next steps. Thank you so much. Here we would like uh, Professor Adebola to speak to us. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Uh, uh, Dr. Ona, thank you for this wonderful presentation. That uh, starting this fifth, fifth series of teleclept. Uh, we want to welcome all participants today. We have more than 62 participants. And this is a new series, the fifth series we are going to have. There are a bit of differences that we're introducing right now. Instead of making it a weekly, we're going to have it twice a month, the first and the last week of the month and but the timing will still be 11 and we encourage everybody to register and hope that the content and the impact will still continue to be impactful.
So once again, I want to thank Smile Train for facilitating this. And we in the West African College of Surgeons continue to provide higher quality of presentations. So once again, I want to welcome everybody to this fifth series. And we look forward to interacting twice a month as we used to do.